let us pray. May your people exalt forever, O God, in the renewed youthfulness of spirit, so that rejoicing now in the restored glory of our adoption, we may look forward in confident hope to the rejoicing of the day of resurrection through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. When the captains and the court officers had brought the apostles in, and made them stand before the sanctuary. The high priest questioned them. We give you strict orders, they be done, to stop teaching in that name. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and want to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles said in reply, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus, though you had killed him by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior, to grant Israel repentance and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, as is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. The Sanhedrin ordered the apostles to stop speaking in the name of Jesus and dismiss them. So they left the presence of the sanctuary, rejoicing that they had been found worthy to suffer this honor for the sake of the name. The word of the Lord. Thank you. 
Revelation. I, John, looked and heard the voices of many angels who surrounded the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They were countless in number and they cried out in a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches, wisdom and strength, honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and earth, and under the earth and in the sea, everything in the universe cry out. To the one who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor, glory and might forever and ever. The four living creatures answered, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Peter answered him, 
Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. He then said to Simon Peter a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Simon Peter answered him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. Jesus said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was distressed that Jesus had said to him a third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Amen, amen, I say to you, when you were younger, you used to dress yourself and go where you wanted. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. He said this signifying, but what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he said, had said this, he said to him, follow me. The Gospel of the Lord. Dear brothers and sisters, each of the Gospels has different version of the events and the grief Jesus' followers experienced after their beloved teacher died. The incident reported in today's Gospel occurs just a few days after Jesus died on the cross. His followers who had made such great promises of loyalty had fled fearing that they were in danger. They had gone back to their native Galilee. In the version we just heard from the Gospel of John, the disciples have already seen the resurrected Christ not once but twice. First when he appeared to the disciples on Easter night and then when he came again a week later when Thomas was with them. And yet they don't know what to do. I am going fishing, says Simon Peter. That seems to be a response to the confusion and frustration with the way the events were unfolding after the crucifixion and death of Jesus. But after a whole night's fishing, they caught nothing, not even one fish found its way into their nets. And accepting the suggestion of the stranger, they were overwhelmed at the size of the catch. The Lord has prepared a meal for them and invites them to bring some their catch. They may have caught the fish, but it was only with the help of the Lord. Without me, you can do nothing. There are all the elements of Eucharist here. They are in the presence of Jesus, the Word of God, and listening to Him. Come and have breakfast. The last meal they had shared together, it was before the crucifixion, during the Last Supper, where Jesus lovingly 
serve them by washing their feet. And now it's time for breakfast, a sign of new day. The new era of risen life has dawned. Come and have breakfast is a reason of take all of you and eat it. He and they are sharing what they have and eating in unity and community. A simple image of the church. As we have heard, they do not ask, who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. The risen Lord does not look as he used to look before. For now he has many faces. He can have the face of our friend, of our enemies, of our neighbors, and so on. He is especially to be found and recognized in the pure, in the poor, in the exploited and weak, and the foreigner. The beloved disciple, traditionally identified as John, was the first to recognize the Lord in the stranger and tell the others. We too must help others recognize the presence of the Lord at work in their lives, and this is evangelization. The reason Lord comes to his disciples just after daybreak. The dark hours and fruitless labor of the night time have given to the dawn a new day, offering new hopes new possibilities, new chances. Darkness does not win. The light always prevails. The arrival of Jesus is like the dawn. He is the light that overcomes all darkness. And after breakfast, Jesus takes Peter aside for a personal conversation. The Lord knows that it is not the lack of love that Peter went back to fishing. Rather, he knew that Peter feels unworthy to serve the one whom he three times denied knowing. So Jesus mercifully and tenderly gives Peter an opportunity to reverse his three denials by three renewed affirmations. And then, after each one of them, Jesus says, Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Jesus renews Peter's commission three times. And now Peter is not a shepherd, is a shepherd, not a fisherman. The Lord believes in Peter's love enough to entrust to him his sheep, the flag of the church. Dear brothers and sisters, we all fall short from time to time as we try to follow our Lord. Our weaknesses and our sins hinder us from loving and obeying Jesus as we should. But like Peter, we can learn from our failures and humbly we can return to the Lord for the grace to begin again. Nothing disqualifies us from our call to be Jesus' disciples and feed his sheep. Then Jesus also gives Peter a prophetic indication of how he will glorify God.
by his martyrdom. It will be a precious result of his renewed dedication to following Jesus. And after this, Peter is truly ready for the mission that Jesus has given to him. He will not deny the Lord again. And we can take a lesson from this experience. When we remain preoccupied with our own guilt, we are tempted to conclude that we have nothing to offer to the Lord. The antidote is to listen to what the Lord has to say. And when we listen in prayer, we discover that He still loves us and He has a mission for us. And in the first reading, we see Peter and his companions. Peter, how to move forward in confident faith after we have been crushed by guilt and remorse. With absolute trust in God, he and other apostles have gone forth and have filled Jerusalem with their teaching. It was a very dangerous time to speak in Jesus' name, which they have been explicitly ordered not to do, but they were willing to risk their lives overjoyed with the message of Jesus is our salvation. No human authority or threat or danger could stop Peter and his companions because they knew that the Lord loves them. He would, they would rather die than betray him again. And Peter boldly declares, we must obey God rather than men. He is able to say this and to live by this conviction because he is not longer relying on himself, on his personal power of his human nature. He is living in the spirit, allowing the power of God's grace to work in him. Dear brothers and sisters, the story of Peter's confirmation as leader of Jesus' disciples shows us the way Jesus works through forgiveness and reconciliation. It is also a reminder for us that the church is not a community of perfect disciples. But in the words of N.T. Wright, one of the leading Bible scholars, Pauline theologian and Anglican bishop, the church is a society of for forgiven sinners repaying their unpayable debt of love by working for Jesus' kingdom in every way they can, knowing themselves to be unworthy of the task. As we join with Peter in professing our love for Jesus, let us never forget that we carry the treasure of the gospel in earthen wet vessels, and that no matter how often we fail, Jesus never, never withdraws his love from us. Dear brothers and sisters, there is one more very important detail we heard about in today's Gospel. In spite of their abundant catch, the disciples discover that Jesus doesn't need what they bring. 
because he had already prepared a meal for them, which is more in than enough. Nevertheless, he invites them to bring what they have caught, to contribute some of their fish to the meal that they will share together. It is as if Jesus is reminding them that in the midst of their shock and confusion and grief, they can do still something. They can contribute, they can give their part, they can offer something, something that matters, something that the world needs. It is as if Jesus knows that when faced with suffering, most of us long to do something, anything to make it better. The 6th century was not a pleasant time to be living in Rome. The city of Rome suffered a series of invasions. Its economy was in shambles and bubonic plague had ravaged the city. And yet, this century, the 6th century, produced some of the greatest leaders of the church, including St. Benedict, the founder of the monastic life, St. Gregory, who left a monastery to become the Pope, and one of the greatest Gregory's contribution as a monastic term Pope was to teach us about the value of prayer in the face of the world's suffering. The monks learned that praying for the world was one of the most important things they could do. And they offered their prayers fervently and abundantly every day. And Gregory taught them that prayer begins with humility. The humility we feel when we see all the problems and suffering that we cannot, with our own efforts, efforts solve. The humility leads us to prayer and contemplation, through which we discover the overwhelming and abundant goodness of God. The disciples in today's story with Jesus gone go fishing. They don't know what else they could do other than what they have always been doing. And the story ends with the disciples experiencing humility of gratitude. Jesus has met them where they are and given them what they needed and invited them to contribute what they can. It is impossible right now to deny the suffering of the world, which seems to come into sharper focus each day with the reports of war, gun violence, poverty and so on. Right now, there is ongoing war between Russia and Ukraine. Many people are dying and suffering. Many families are displaced and separated from each other. We are all humbled by this and by all our limitations in the face of suffering. Sometimes we ask ourselves what we can do. And very often we forget about the others being preoccupied with our own problems. But we can always do something. Regardless of who we are and where we are, we can do something 
right now. We can take the humility we feel in the face of these challenges and channel it into our prayers, trusting that our loving God hears those prayers and he will, he will offer us glimpses of God's abundant goodness and grace to which we we'll respond in humble gratitude. Dear brothers and sisters, today's story of the disciples' final encounter with the resurrected Jesus is the end of the Gospel of John. But this ending is really a kind of an epilogue, an answer to the question, in what way will Jesus show himself to us after he is gone? The answer is that Jesus shows himself to us now the way he did from the very beginning with grace upon grace, with astonishing abundance, with the invitation to follow him. Whatever we face today, may we know that God has given each one of us more than enough, that God has invited us to follow our risen, risen Lord, to do what we can to relieve suffering, to counter injustice, to reveal God's abundant and steadfast love to all the world. Amen. Amen. Now let us stand, let us profess our faith. We thank God for the
my shepherd hear us. Let us pray in silence for our personal intentions. Let us pray. Divine shepherd hear us. Lord Jesus, we thank you for choosing Peter and his successors as head shepherds of your church. May we experience in them your shepherding care, leading us to the eternal life where you live and care forever and ever. Amen.
may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and giving thanks broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this all of you and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. Oh 
deliver us, Lord, we pray from every evil, graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy you may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs>